This is the Aurelius Podcast, episode 48 with Aaron Casali. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder at Aurelius and your host for the Aurelius Podcast, where we discuss all things UX, research, and product. In this episode, we have Erin Casali. She has a hybrid background in design, psychology, technology, and business. She's currently head of design at Jetpack, part of Automatic. Erin and I had a really thoughtful conversation about design leadership and what it means to be a manager in the field of UX and research. She has a ton of experience in this area and has given multiple presentations about the topic, so there was a lot to dig into. We touched on some of the differences between being a team member and a manager are struggles you might face in making the switch from an individual contributor role to a leader or manager, and what you can expect for how your job changes when you take on your first leadership role. All really great stuff that junior level folks all the way up to executives in UX and research will have takeaways from in this episode. The Aurelius podcast is brought to you by Aurelius, the powerful research repository and insights platform. Aurelius is an all-in-one space for researchers to organize notes, capture insights, analyze data, and share outcomes with your team. We recently announced two of our biggest features yet. Aurelius now offers transcriptions and our automatic report builder. You can add any audio or video recording and have notes created for you automatically. Then, Aurelius automatically creates a report with every key insight and recommendation from your project which you can then edit, design, and share with anyone right from Aurelius. Check us out at AureliusLab.com. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Okay, let's get to it. Hey, Aaron. Hello. Good morning. Well, not morning. I already made this mistake. It's not morning for you. It's my morning, but afternoon for you. Yes. Awesome. Well, hey, I appreciate you jumping on and taking the time to chat with us on our show. Pretty excited to talk with you about some things, especially prior talks and things like that that you've given, I think will fit really well with the folks who listen to our podcast. But before I even go any further, we should make sure folks hear about that background that you have because it's pretty extensive. Maybe take a few minutes and just uh, you know kind of introduce yourself, talk about your background, your experience, and things that you're passionate about. Yes, no, you're absolutely right. The simplest introduction, the shortest one is... I work as head of design for Jetpack, which is one of the main products of Automatic. And people usually, when I say Automatic, say, what? It's the company behind WordPress.com that contributes to the WordPress project. Currently, we have acquired also Tumblr, WooCommerce, SimpleNote, and a few other tools pretty much around WordPress ecosystem. My background, as you hinted, is a little varied in the sense that I studied a mix of computer science, design, and psychology. I worked as a developer for a few years. And then over time, I switched first to visual design, then UX design. And then for me, the, in a way, the most interesting jump was to design management because in a sense, it's beautiful how psychology plays a role across, you know, design people, projects, and so on. And that's where I am now. I've been doing design management now for over 10 years. Awesome. That's one of the things that always really impresses me with people who've been in the field for a long time, the depth and breadth of their experience. We recently had Nick Fink on the podcast and the same thing in his case. Yeah. So, you know, it sounds like, you know, Nick. Yep. I mean, just how much he's seen, how much you've seen in sort of all of these little bits and bots in your background that contribute to the work that you're doing today is always really fascinating to me. You kind of touched on it already. So I have to ask. How does psychology play into design management or design leadership? What's the thing that comes to mind to you? Yes, well, for me, it's it's really about the interaction with the people, right? In a way, the shift from design to management for me, you know, it can be a natural one, especially I would say for more service design oriented people, because instead of designing the product, you design the organization that designs the product. So mm. you know what the end goal is, but you know that you need to shape the right team. And when you're talking people, well, it's literally all about psychology. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are a lot of classes for management, degrees, and so on. But the amount of insight that my background in psychology is able to give here, I mean, I'm not a trained psychologist, but I have a background, right? It's incredible because I can capture when things are happening and gather nuances, being able also to switch the level I'm talking to, right? I can talk at a project level, so very factual, very, in a sense, objective as much as possible, but I can also go down a few notches and instead engage at a personal level and try to acknowledge that maybe the problem we are discussing has a source in the person. And if we fix that, 
then magically everything else self-solves, right? So there is a lot of things in there for me that really excite me. It's it's a really beautiful convergence for me. And by the way, it doesn't make me perfect. I mean, it's not that I have <laughs> magical ability of reading people and interacting with people. Sometimes I have difficult conversations. Sometimes I make mistakes. But I don't know. It's an entirely different level of, of engaging. Yeah, that makes total sense. I don't think anybody's reading this suspecting you're claiming to be perfect. None of us are. <laughs> but it's interesting that you bring that point up too, because kind of what I was taking away from what you were saying is that it isn't so much that you have to be a trained psychologist to be better at management or that, as you said, gives you any kind of magic ability. It's almost like design in some sense, right? Like anybody can design, but someone who is trained or has a background in it, is it has the ability to notice particular things, understand what they are and their implications, right, in design. And I have to, what I was taking away from what you were saying is because you have that background in psychology, you can notice certain things, just as anybody can be observe behavior, you can observe certain behavior and kind of get a sense for what that might mean. And, you know, some, some of the implications of that, and then maybe how to work with that person to, uh, for the best or desired outcome for the team. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone had the experience, at least I hope, of a good team in a positive mood that is creating things. Like it's, of course, the health of the people in the team is amazing to have, but also it has very dark benefits in terms of productivity. I know it's it's a relationship that in a sense should not be done, but in other ways, if I focus on the people, I know I'm also driving everything else. So for me, that's a big one. That's a really great point. And I think companies have said that for a long time, take care of your people and the rest will, but I don't know that everybody does it in practice, right? So I guess with that, something that comes to mind that I would like to ask you, how do you make sure you're actually practicing that? You're not saying this is important, but you know, you're know you actually practicing those things, focusing on the team, making sure it is a, a happy, productive, well-running team. Yeah. I mean, we can touch a, a few different topics. So we can talk about safe spaces. We can talk about... Actually, yeah. One of the most pragmatic suggestions is working on feedback. Feedback is a huge topic and one that most of the time I see people overestimating themselves like oh, I'm good at feedback I'm you know I'm very objective I try to do things we feel we are good at that it's, it's however a skill that can provide a huge amount of benefits and a skill that is probably one of the easiest also to train still difficult but among the various soft skills at a psychology level that's one of the easiest to to practice and train mm-hmm. there are some tips like be more objective, talks about the problem or talk about the thing and never about the person. But also there are things that a little bit connecting what we were saying before. I often start by saying that there is a myth around negative criticism in the sense that I don't know how many know Kahneman. He explains very well the idea of regression to the mean in the sense that if we think about a person that is improving, right? We can draw a line, ascending line of this person improving their skills over time. And if at any point of feedback, this person will never be perfectly on their average, right? Some days they will do things better. Some days they will do things worse. So there is a bias there because if these people are doing something worse and we criticize them, it feels that they improve, but what they just did is regressing to their mean. So they underperformed for once. And the next time they're just going back to their own average. And on the other way, if they're performing better than average and you give a positive reinforcement, it feels like that they regressed a bit. But again, they just went back to their own average. Mm -hmm. So we have a psychological here perception, a cognitive bias, where we feel that the negative criticism worked and the positive didn't. Mm -hmm. But in practice, they both work in very different ways. And I would argue, actually, that a lot of the negative ones can be easily reframed or shaped as positive, as constructive, not just constructive, but really positive. I see. I mean, that's the the most interesting piece I took from that is that recognizing someone's average, (laughs) right? Because it's kind of like a pendulum. It could swing one way or the other, but it eventually is going to come back to center. And if you have to do the really hard work of understanding the people on your team to find the averages to know, well, am I giving the right kind of feedback here? Or, you know, are they just kind of coming back to where they ought to be, or are they actually progressing? How do you do that? How do you go about figuring that out? Uh, Frankly, so one of the simplest things, and it may not apply to everyone, it may depend on the situation and the workspace 
one is leaping in, but just try, for example, for a month to only give positive reinforcement and mm. train that and see what effect you have. Of course, at the beginning, you will be, it will be difficult and you will be rough. And over time, you will be doing reinforcement. And by the way, when I say positive, I'm saying that in a, in a sense that it still has to be to fulfill all the requirements of good feedback. So we say often that constructive criticism, which usually is a synonymous, well, not synonymous, but it's affiliated with negative. We say, okay, you need to be precise. You need to give a direction where you want them to go. You know, there are certain things we say around that. The same things apply to positive, like giving someone positive feedback as in, oh, you did a good job. That's not feedback. <laughs> I mean, it's great emotionally, right? right? But you're not actually giving feedback. If instead you're basically saying, oh, you know, that specific thing you did, that specific path you chose, the specific, among all the things you could have done, that was good. And, and I'm telling you why it was good. That's a good positive criticism because it's precise, it's motivating, and telling you why it was good. Mm -hmm. and, and it can be incredibly powerful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Instead of just, because if you just say you did a great job, that's praise. It's not criticism it's right. not i guess it could be considered feedback but it's not it's not super constructive right if you can point to something specific say you did a great job because of this that either explicitly you know spoken or unspoken let somebody know well those are the kind of decisions and those are the kind of behaviors that i should then model you know i think just as humans you pick that up and then all of a sudden that's where you can progress because you have specific things that you know you can do not just some positive outcome great you did a good job thank you for that <laughs> you can't necessarily replicate that exactly fascinating stuff Okay, as we were talking about this, one of the things I thought of, we've got folks who listen to this show that are in all sorts of positions in their company, right? All the way from brand new to maybe UX design research or product team, all the way to somebody like yourself, right? Who's leading a team or, or an executive of a team. One of the things I want to kind of step back and say, as someone who's certainly been there, what do you feel like, you know, junior mid-level members of a team need to know about managers? you know, that they can be better parts, uh, better members of the team? That's a very good question. I think one of the best advice I ever personally got, and I think it's still the first advice I would, I would answer this question with, is try to understand what is their goal. Because again, that's a very design approach. It's a user, it's your manager, but it's a user, mm -hmm. right? And they are fulfilling certain goals in their life, in their career, right? So if you understand better their, the angle and the perspective they're having, why they're giving you maybe a specific feedback, they're telling you to do a specific kind of work, then you can fulfill it better. In a talk years ago about designers consultants, I was, for example, giving the example that there is a joke, I think on a in coding horror website. Mm -hmm. um, and there is the joke, oh, why do you want to do, why do you want to redesign the website, right? And the answer of the manager was, well, because... I'm trying to show off I'm a good manager, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and we, it's a joke, right? I mean, on the surface, it's a joke. But if we stop for a second, that's true. Like Absolutely. their new manager in a new role, they need to show that they're effective. The joke is actual reality of a lot of scenarios. And if you, in a team, are able to understand that, sure, you're trying to do a website that is the best possible website for users. But also, you're able to understand that your, your manager, and which means the proxy that talks about your team to the rest of the organization, is happy. Mm -hmm. Then your team is going to be best positioned inside the organization. So th there is a little bit of a, of a shift. But for me, the emphasis is that this is a design skill, you know? Yeah. If I yeah. was talking with someone from a different profession, you need to teach them, okay, what's focus on the user? What do you do? How do you research that? How do you approach it? But we designers, we do this. You mm -hmm. just need to understand that's a like user and they have goals. I couldn't agree more. I'm, we don't have audio, or I'm sorry, our video on this podcast, but you would have seen me nodding in agreement the entire time listening to this. One of the reasons why it should be no surprise, it's a very recurring theme on our show. And we talk about biases. It's something I'm biased to because I talk about this all the time as well, maybe in a different way than you did. So you're talking about like sort of the inter-team relationship. I often talk about it as with the relationship to, as a designer in any capacity to stakeholders and to the business. And I say the exact same thing. You cannot be effective and help them or, you know, sell your ideas or recommendations or suggestions for change until you understand what it is they need to accomplish and what they're on the hook for. And I love the one thing that you said, 
because you just kind of, what are they trying to do? So I, I like to often ask the question, what does your boss, if I'm talking to a stakeholder, what does your boss want from you? Help me understand that so I can help you get what you need. And it, it really is that simple. And of course, there's a bunch of nuance and steps and work that need to happen to do that. But it is, it is as simple as figuring that out and then going from there. Yeah, exactly. Really cool stuff. Well, you know, I, there, you gave a talk that caught my eye that was very similar in that respect and on how designers can go from, you know, maybe not just being somebody who makes the thing that ends up on a screen or builds the website or designs the app, but actually to more of a consultative type role with your stakeholders, with your businesses. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yes. For me, it's stepping into the duality of designers when, especially at the beginning of their career, they're super hyper-focused on the user, right? Mm -hmm. So that's their goal. That's the problem they're trying to solve. They're trying to make, you know, the best possible design to fulfill the user needs. The thing is, at some point in the career, one needs to start understanding that there are also the business needs. And this is not a duality in terms of, you know, capitalism is bad and so on. <laughs> it, it's just a matter of understanding that we need to fulfill both because if the business doesn't succeed, well, there is no service to provide to the users. In the talk you're referring, for example, I say things like a design fails if it doesn't ship. It's a bad design if the design doesn't ship. And it's a bit of an extreme take, but on the other hand, it's true, like you can have the best possible design that fulfills all the user needs, but maybe it's a disaster for the business because you haven't considered the amount of work it triggers for support or the amount of resources it needs to, to be built or whatever reasons. That's not a great design. I'm sorry, right? And I think this is a topic that is not often spoken to, but even if you look of, of a lot of even industrial designers, interior designers in the history of design, you see that they mention a lot of the times, oh, we did this chair or we did this space solution and it's great because it's modular. It's great because it's built on with cheap materials, right? Mm -hmm. And they're the famous designer in the history of design, right? So this duality for me, it's a shift that designer needs to take in as they grow. And it's an important one. It doesn't have to be antagonistic. There are, there are good, good interplays that can happen there. And again, as a designer, we are very well positioned to try to propose where that interplay happens. And a little later in the career, I would also say that one of the difficult things is wearing these two hats. In the sense, sometimes, even myself, even today, sometimes I give a comment and I get a note that is like, how can you say that it's a bad design? You are a designer, you're suggesting to do this. And I'm like, yeah, but... On the other hand, it's the best possible design we can ship in two weeks that fulfills the need. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking that first before, you know, a four months design that requires two teams to be executed, you know? Yeah. And then we can get there because if then a hypothesis is validated, so you enter in a bit, little bit of nuance, it's attention. It's absolutely attention. And so making also explicit is important, but it's an important thing things to do. Yeah, very well said. Very well said. Understanding the things that you suggest, again, the implications they have to other people, other areas of the business. Some of that, I think, comes with experience. But other parts of it is, as you would suggest, that's a designer's trait. That's, a, that's something that you know, we're equipped to do and be better at sort of earlier in our career. And, and I would argue have to be if we are to be successful. And I think that everybody listening to this at one point or another, whether they design this thing or, or not, was a part of some project at the time, maybe didn't ship. And they looked back on it and said, oh, they were idiots. They wasted it. It was perfect. It was great. The business didn't get it or they didn't get it or this, whatever. The budgets, they just don't understand it. And that's not the case. Like when you say a failed design is one that doesn't ship, you know, clever and good are mutually exclusive. You may have made a very clever design and there's no arguing that. There's some really cool stuff a lot of us can all make, but good it meets the needs, you know, 360, right? It meets the needs of the people that, that are eventually going to have to use this thing, but it meets the needs also of the business and all facets of it, not just it's going to make them money, which I honestly really appreciate the fact that you call that out and say like, hey, look, that's just the way the world works. It's not a bad thing, but we got to be mindful of it. As a quick side note, I think how we make money and whether we do that ethically is a whole nother conversation that's just as important. Yes. But the reality yes. is if they don't make money, 
we don't have jobs as designers. We can't provide the service that should be valuable to these people, right? Like understanding all this stuff actually, it makes you a really, really effective designer. I love the fact that it's, if it doesn't ship, it's a failed design. Doesn't mean that you're not a good designer. Doesn't mean it wasn't clever, but it did and fail. I would add to this topic, sorry, that there is also an interesting aspect there. I was recently reviewing a brand refresh and I was comparing what the, the studio published as the, you know, the, on their own portfolio in a sense, and what the company actually refined and, and used effectively. And you clearly notice, and by the way, the company, it's not one of these cases where the design was, you know, diluted or, you know, made bad. But you clearly see that how cutting edge the portfolio example is. And it was beautifully executed, a lot of nuances, a lot of finishing, and then you notice that the company one, still a great design, but you know that there are some changes that are clearly and obviously made to fit a little bit the brand, the overall brand, to be a little bit more efficient because it should work on print, it should work on digital, it should work, you know? And so you notice this. And it, neither these two, neither these two are a failure, right? It's good that the designer went a little bit over the edge, but it's also completely understandable that the company choose an approach that is a little bit subdued. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's another thing too is, and I don't really want to call it compromise. I think it's just an understanding of, of how you arrive at that middle ground because you might be right, but you might not be 100% right. Does that make sense? In that case, it sounds like almost that's what you were describing there. Yes, yes. Also because a great edgy design inspires people, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's not going to be executed 100%. Yeah, I've liked using that approach purposefully when recommending certain things. It's basically like the analogy I give is, let's say you're trying to find how far you can go and how effective you can be or how edgy you might be. Find the edge of the cliff. Because if you find the edge of the cliff and you make that recommendation, people are going to go, whoa, 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 that's way too close. And they take one or two steps back. You're still way closer to the edge than you would have been if you played it safe and just said, well, we think right here. Because then you're always going to walk it back, right? There's always going to be some hesitancy about a new idea and you can continue to push and work harder. And sometimes you you get people to see it all the way through to your vision. But oftentimes, if you sort of over-index, right? If you go a little too far, people go, well, that's too much, but you're onto something there. Let's take it one step back and all of a sudden you're way farther than you thought you could have been. It's a useful technique, even psychologically, right? To sort of push somebody way past where they expected and, and go, okay, well, I can't suggest we come all the way back because clearly that's not a good idea. Right? It just wouldn't make sense in making it seem like a compromise. It's just an interesting technique. So Aaron, one of the things that came to my mind as we were talking about this is kind of going back to management. There, It's a big difference going from a designer, an individual practitioner on a UX design research team, and then becoming a manager. What's, what's the biggest thing? What was the biggest change for you in adopting that new role? For me personally, it has been a long time ago, so it's a bit difficult to tell a story. I coach people, I help people exactly in this shift. So I would say that one of the first things that emerges every single time, well, not maybe not 100%, some people get it, but pretty close to 100% is you need to step back from designing. You need to step, stop trying to do what you were doing before. Mm -hmm. It's a different job. It's a different, in a way, it's a different profession that is still very much informed from your background, right? So that's the thing, right? I'm not designing anymore the pixels, the product. I'm now designing the team. And that's like letting go is the first difficult thing to do. And I would say then there is a second one that happens fairly often is that this can get a little bit into micromanagement, so it's an interesting one to highlight, is that resisting the temptation to do the work for them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So in a sense that as a team lead, of course, if you got there and if you got there for, for good reasons, it's very likely you're better of the junior person you just hired. But if you constantly step in, you're not just micromanaging, but you're also one wasting your time and to not allowing them to grow, right? Resisting the temptation on your side and on their side, providing for them the space. I, I say the space to fail, but in the sense of, you know, try to do, allow them to do things, you know, you have then the time or the space to correct instead of correcting before they do things. Mm -hmm. Because that's how they grow. That's how you grow. But also that's how you tell the team that's, Mistakes are fine, <laughs> right? right? Because you allow them 
and they see that nothing happens. Actually, not just nothing, but a growth moment happens. Yeah, that's, again, it just can't help but sit and nod in agreement. It's just so very well said, particularly about the one point of giving somebody the space to grow. You stunt their growth if you just come in and fix it for them. You know, like you said, there's two points to that. Number one, it's not your job anymore. And number two, you're preventing the people on your team the opportunity to grow and to get better. I had a similar experience when I had moved from sort of senior level practitioner into a management role. And I was still doing, I was still actively doing design, but I had found a similar experience where my focus was so much on the excellence of the work, not as much initially on growing the people and their excellence of the work. That's that's the shift, right? That's the big change and the challenge that I think a lot of us face, something to be mindful of, especially as, you know, there's a lot of folks right now, I think in the UX world, things are moving very quickly, faster than they ever have been, at least from my experience. There's a lot of folks who just a few years ago were junior level UXers or researchers, and now all of a sudden they find themselves in senior level or even potential promotions to lead a team because that's how quickly our profession is growing. And this is just one of those things, I think, be mindful of that before you walk into it, (laughs) before you walk into the wall, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, you know, we're talking a lot about management and leadership, and I'll give you a minute to answer this one because this might be tough. What was the most challenging position you ever found yourself in as a manager, as a leader of a design team? And, you know, maybe talk about how you how you manage that challenge. Yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of lot of different scenarios here I could I could mention. I think management wise are usually at the beginning of my switch to, to management where I still didn't have the, the safety and the security of knowing how things worked. Then at the same time in the role, you're expected to, to not just fulfill the role, but also to, to push the design vision to stakeholders, to your own boss, to the leadership team. And so there is there was always this duality at the beginning of trying to do a great job with the team, but at the same time trying to, to teach and educate the senior management around that, right? And I think that tension created quite a few situations where I can enter in a situation when I was putting too much pressure on the team mm-hmm. because I was trying, again, goes back to what we were saying before, but I was trying to to prove certain things to to management, to other higher stakeholders. And that pressure is not healthy. I mean, I could have, with the hindsight I I have now, I could have achieved the same goal in a different way, but I was in a position of having to demonstrate both toward my team and toward stakeholders. That was probably one of the most difficult time of my career. I cannot get into too much details. Yeah, that sounds difficult. You have pressure from all sides to sort of prove something or show something and sell that to them. I guess without getting into too much detail, I would ask, what advice would you give your younger self in that situation today with all the experience you now have? Part of it is to not be afraid of setting expectation. In the sense, expectation can be negotiated, but if they're never set, they're always going to be stretched because (laughs) nobody is going to to say anything. So I will try to over-deliver on every possible side, but over-delivering on something that is never said, Mm -hmm. right? So it's, if at the time, for example, I was able to say, you know, this is what you can expect in a week, or this is what we can do in the timeframe you gave us, and so on, with precision, maybe they have said no, they say, okay, but then I can negotiate, right? But I never, at the beginning, never put down that kind of, stone to allow the discussion to happen. Yeah. And that one of the things that caused a lot of problems because everyone is expecting something different and they never took the time to align any problem. So I was constantly in tension because I'm not doing enough. They were expecting things. It's a lot of problem. So put down that stone, discuss where the expectation is, and then you can work to over deliver because most of the time you can achieve or overachieve that milestone. But if it's never down, <laughs> it doesn't happen. <laughs> this is such a great point. I'm so glad that you brought this up because I don't think this is actually discussed enough, particularly in design leadership. I think in traditional management books and courses, like you kind of mentioned earlier, they probably talk about this quite a bit, but expectations and communication. Most problems, I would argue maybe all problems, stem from communications and expectations. And you're right. You know, the thing I took away from what you were just saying there, super important is that if expectations are never clearly set, you're either always stretching them or not meeting them 
because we don't have alignment, like you said, on what is to be expected, what what and when, you know, I think is such a big deal. And it's fine to actually, at least I think, I think it's fine to want to stretch to overachieve those expectations. But the thing is, if you don't explicitly say and agree and set expectations and you're constantly over delivering, by default, you are setting an expectation. You're setting a precedent that, well, this is how these people were able to work. They can they can meet this at this time and this quality all the time. And then that is a very quick road to burnout, in my opinion. Yes. That's a big challenge for your own self and your own health. Yes. Awesome. Yet another thing, <laughs> another brilliant piece of advice Aaron shares and some things to think about. And I think that that applies to not only managers, but individual, you know, sole practitioners too, like people actually executing and doing the design. And so as a manager, it sounds to me like, you know, one of the things that you focus on doing is making sure expectations are set with the team, you know, so the the term managing up, setting expectations with mm -hmm. stakeholders yes. in the business as well, right? And I want also to add that sometimes it's fine to ask, not sometimes, it's fine to ask. And if I to ask in so many situations, like sometimes I, even myself, even when I was trying to set an expectation, I was like, oh, we can deliver this by this date. And I realized looking at them and I was like, oh, okay, that was way beyond what I expected. And it's fine to ask them. So what are you expecting for me to, to do by this date or to do in this project or to do whatever? I would say doubles up in management in the sense people in position of responsibility, independent of management, not management. Don't need to have all the answer, but they need to be able to find it. I'm a big, big proponent of what is basically called a consultation decision making or advisory decision making. It's important that you drive the decision, but you don't need to have the answer yourself. And that for me is key. Yeah, that's another really big one too. I think that you find yourself in when you're younger in your career, you feel like you always have to have the answer. But really, you know, you are a part of a larger decision. You, your role is to help find the answer. Sometimes you may have the answer and it's convincing others that, the, that that's the right answer. That's okay too. But you don't always have to feel like you have the answer. One of the questions that came to mind in terms of communication and setting expectations with a team, I think makes a lot more sense and people can kind of figure out whether you are in a design leadership role right now or not. But I wanted to ask you, what's the biggest difference in communication setting expectations between doing that with other designers and researchers and doing that with the business? What's the biggest difference you found there? All right. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I was saying that, funny enough, I, I love studying across fields and across industries and across even subjects that have nothing to do with industry or whatever. A lot of the time, people are saying the same thing with different words. Mm -hmm. And I usually summarize this by saying it's a matter of vocabulary, dictionary. Often, like the business side and the design side are actually saying the same thing, but they use words that are so different, a register that is so different, they don't understand each other. So, you know, and for me, one of these, the most basic examples of this is the user, because of course the business cares about the user, but they care about a different perspective with different words. And so it looks like they're saying a different thing, right? Mm -hmm. So the shift there is trying to reframe, okay, I need to say this concept from the design field, but I need to talk with business people about this. So I need to shift my language. So I need to translate the words literally to say the thing in a way that is more appealing for them and more understandable for them. From one side, from a linguistic side, I love language. I find it super fascinating. But from, from a pragmatic side, that's a skill to be developed. Yeah. Learning these two languages. Yeah. That's huge. That's such a huge point. Here's a really good, I think maybe simple example, something that we would care about as a UX team, make it easy to use. That's kind of ambiguous. And, and that has its own baggage. And when we say it and what that might mean to translate that to a business, that means they can do the thing we want them to do faster. What that then translates to is you have more people doing that thing, your desired outcome at scale. What that then translates to, you see where I'm going with this, you make more money as a business. So this is why you should care about this, right? It's not just we want to, because obviously we do care about the customers and the people who use our products and services. But here's the reason why you need to care about that, right? Not, not that you should need any more incentive, but, uh, but it's important to be able to translate that as to why this is an importance level, maybe above something else in certain situations. Yes, that's a very good example. Awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Finally, I contributed something to the conversation <laughs> rather than just pulling all of this great information out of you. You know, and with that, we've I've been doing that now for a while, and I need to be respectful of your time. One of the things I like to ask before we wrap up most episodes is, you know, if I were if I were to get hit on the head or develop amnesia, and somebody came and asked, so what did you and Aaron talk about? What was what was that conversation all about? How would you answer that question? How would you summarize what we discussed today? I would say that is think it's a lot about thinking about the relationship between people and acknowledging that everyone has their own goal and you can use your design skills to incorporate these goals when you work and collaborate with people. Awesome. Very good, concise summary of our of our conversation today. We covered a lot of ground and I uh, I can definitely ask a few more questions about leadership and the change and the difference between those things, but you got to be respectful of your time. I am curious though, is there anything you want to share with folks that we haven't talked about today? I think we touched a lot of good topics. We can go, as you hinted, much more in detail of a, of a lot of this. I personally have, uh, so my own site, intenseminimalism.com, is where I try to write about these topics. And I know that it looks like a blog, but I prefer considering it more as a repository. I try to write things in a way that is, in a sense, timeless. And I use it personally as a reference. When I study something, I try to write notes and I look there. So I write there a lot about perspective on leadership, how to become a new lead, how to give good feedback, how to receive feedback, and all the topics we touched today. And maybe more, uh, more pointed I could point to an article on safe space that I think it could be very interesting as a next step in getting deeper into these topics. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure we have links to all those in the show notes. So for those listening, as you normally would, go ahead and head to the page where we have our discussion with Aaron and you'll be able to find those links and check those things out in greater detail. With that, I just have to say thank you again for jumping on and having this conversation today. I got a lot out of it and I'm quite sure that anybody listening, whether they're going to be in a a leadership position, whether they're in one today, they're going to take a lot out of the advice you had to share. Thank you so much for inviting me. Awesome. All right, everybody. We will see you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Aurelius, the research and insights tool that helps you analyze, search, and share all your research in one place so you can go from data to insights to action faster and easier. Check out Aurelius for yourself with a 30-day trial by going to AureliusLab.com. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot if you would give us a review on iTunes to let others know what you think. You can catch all new episodes of the Aurelius podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts like iTunes, Spotify, and more. Stay up to date when new episodes come out by signing up for email updates on our website.